Hello and welcome everyone to the Main Street Matters webinar. My name is Patrick Kaiser. I am the executive director of Heart on Main Street. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping independent retailers grow their businesses, evolve, and thrive within their local communities. Our guests today are is Lynn Falk and Suzanne Raffenstein uh, of Retail Works Inc. Lynn is the principal and founder of Retail Works Inc. And Suzanne is the director of displays. So thank you all so much for coming on today. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to be talking about visual merchandising techniques for retailers, which is a topic that I am so excited about. I think this is something that all retailers really need to look at and focus on. Effective visual merchandising is something that can really set your products apart within your store, really make your store stand out from others. But it's also a skill that really has to be learned in order to do it well. Uh, and that is the background of Retail Works Inc. Retail Works Inc. is an award-winning commercial interior design, display, and branding firm that is headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, they've been in business for over 26 years and have been pr providing design and display solutions to businesses all across the nation. They specialize in working with Main Street retailers to create engaging spaces, memorable customer experiences, which if you've been on some of our other webinars, a customer experiences is so, so important to, to bringing your customers back and having those repeat customers. Their team includes visual merchandising magicians, which I love that title, <laughs> uh, and display artists who work collaboratively with retailers to showcase their brand, their products, and tell their story. So again, Lynn, Suzanne, thank you all so much for being on today. Uh, I'm so excited to have you on today. I know our audience is going to learn a lot from you. So let's jump in. I kind of want to pick your brain a little bit as designers. So... First thing, when you are walking into a store, what kind of catches your attention? What are the first things that you're noticing about a store as you walk in? That's a really loaded question I know. <laughs> to start with because our senses go all over the place. Right. I'm sure. Yeah. In three seconds, we are hit with, you know, aroma, music or sound, um, lighting levels ceiling height, traffic aisles, signage, fixturing. I mean, everything, the entire style and theme of the store hits you. And, you know, it's our job to make sure that retailers are really understanding how to fine tune those variables. So it's not an overly chaotic environment. The brain is very lazy and doesn't want to have to think about shopping. So we always say visual merchandising is a really a key thing because we want to create displayed focal points right up front, lower, where the eye hits those. And then a little bit further into the store, you want a bit of a higher display with something interesting and it's illuminated well and it's well signed so that the feet follow the eyes. And then you can literally shop, get your customers to shop the entire store and, you know, visual merchandising on the fixtures, making sure your fixtures are uniform um, so that, again, it's not visually chaotic or sensory chaotic because in today's world, we don't have the time and our subconscious doesn't want to have to deal with a lot of visual or sensory overload. Yeah. Well, I, and I love shopping. I love going into small stores. I mean, gosh, who doesn't love shopping? <laughs> but um, and I've spent a lot of time doing that. Um but one of the things, uh, one, when I walk into a store, it's scent is really important to me. Um, and two, there's always something that's going to catch my eye. And maybe it's like one object that's really, really large that I'm like, ooh, what's over there? Or sometimes it's maybe a display that just has a very impactful color. Mm -hmm. Maybe the color itself is just very dominant in the display, but, but my eye will go directly to it. And then that leads, my eyes go first, my body follows. Right. Um, but there's always some sort of object or area um, that will catch my attention and pull me into the store, past the threshold, and get me into the mix so then I can start wandering around. Um, yeah. But definitely Something order to, first, because that hits you it, it, like well, a brick beat right. before sometimes you walk in the door. 
I mean, we could talk, we could do a whole webinar just on scent yeah. or yeah. sound. Yeah. Well, before um, we were, before we got on, we were talking, I was in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, which is up near Milwaukee. And there's a store there that the scent of, of their, the candy and confectionaries brought yes. me in, certainly. Uh, I wasn't it's planning on going in, but I got drawn in because it smelled yes. delicious. Yeah. <laughs> So but those so, are things that really pull me in and want me to stay in there and keep wandering around. And as I, my eye, you know, wanders and, oh, what's that over there? Ooh, what's that over there? It's, it's, there has to be a little impactful, the, what Lynn was saying, focal point displays that will, um, th that have to be a little bit larger so that I'm pulled in that direction and of the store and illuminate it. And then once I'm there, then I can see all the other little things associated with it. So, so the sense of so really hitting on those different senses, it sounds right. like, um, and then you know, something colorful, something in there to draw people in right. different heights. It sounds like you're also looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm also very motivated by humor. So if I see something odd or humorous, that to me, I, I, you know, I appreciate that so much, but that will engage me as well and pull me in. So if there's just something quirky and well, fun. And that's, and, that's if they know the target market mm -hmm. and the target market, you know, if you yeah, have a product that line that's, yeah, that's humorous, then you can incorporate that into your original merchandise. And of course, I know. see, you asked a loaded question. We it could is, go on right? and on. We could go, we could go all that. <laughs> and someone walks in. And one more thing, because I'm a former store owner myself, is um, when you walk into a store, and I always, I always felt like, when I had a customer come into my place, I didn't like shout at them hello before they even crossed the threshold. Mm. I would at, at my very best come around the counter or go to them and get close enough where I can greet them. I think that is really important. I don't like it when someone's in the back of the store yelling, oh, hello, hello. I mean, sure. unless they're really, you know, involved in something, but you know, let them come into the store, at least cross that yeah, first we say that welcome it's... mat and then um, greet them. Well, and yeah, we always want, we call the transition zone, at least the first mm -hmm. eight feet of the store. People have to kind of get acclimated if they're not a regular patron. So they have to absorb the store, make sense of it. They don't want to look stupid, but they just need this little moment. And right. literally it happens in seconds. Um, but we don't want merchandise and fixtures all the way up to the, you know, three feet from the door. And we've seen that. And, right. and yeah. a lot of times it's it's a subtraction method that we work with small retailers. We say people will act, customers will see more of your product lines if you take some of it off the floor. Right. Because people are like, oh, no, I, if they don't see it, they don't think I have it. And they're not going to want it. And they're not going to, I mean, they're not going to buy it. And that's not the case. The brain, again, shuts down if there's too much going on in the store. So from a, just kind of setting things up, if, if someone is struggling with something, they have it right by the door, kind of just a, a recommendation would be, you know, move it in a little bit, get it out of that threshold. Um, that yeah, you want to bring them in as far as you can and then yeah. shut the door real quick. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Lock it. <laughs> People tend to move to the right. So most retailers know that customers come in, they're going to move to the right. And that's kind of the power wall there. Um, and the left the left right to the right by the door there tends to be more of a dead space but there are ways to bring people if if you all of a sudden your door tends to be on the right side of the store there are ways to, to bring people over to the left side i mean really the way you lay out your store is imperative to getting people to shop the entire store Oh, I know uh, Retail Works Inc. has a kind of philosophy behind what they're doing in their visual merchandise. You might have kind of hit on some elements of that, but can you talk to us about about your philosophy and um, how you how you work with retailers? Right. So we kind of call it the triangle, and you know we're really good designers, but I think there are a lot of people that have that knack. You know, they just understand how to put color together, they know how to put a pyramid of products together into a nice display. Um, but that, so that's one element, understanding the design principles and elements, but then we also understand consumer behavior and environmental psychology. So how people react to certain things in an environment, whether it's the volume of the music or the ceiling height, as I'd mentioned earlier, or how we can use lighting to get people to walk through a store. So 
Yes. Consumer behavior is affected by all of the design elements and principles that we incorporate and use as tools. Mm -hmm. The third thing oh. is we understand the bottom line. We understand budgets. We understand, you know, if you're going to put X, Y, Z into your store, we want to find out how long, if you own the property or if you have a lease, how long is that lease going to be? Mm -hmm. can, can we get a return on the investment of what you put in here by raising sales X, Y, Z mm -hmm. to eventually cover the costs of the renovation? So that's the the triangle is design, um, consumer behavior, and then understanding a return on investment and profit loss statements and inventory and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, putting kind of all of those together and especially paying attention to the finances. You know, how do yes. we help that? Um, you know, I think a lot might be thinking about the design, but I mean, really the the financial part of that of that is really important and um, how to make a profit off of off of uh, how yes. and increase the profit off of what you're doing. So correct. Yeah. Uh, what would you consider just to be some best practices for for retailers? If we're looking at a store wanting to set up um, uh, displays, what are some, and we've hit on a couple, and you know, lighting, but what are some really good things that really every retailer should be focused on and looking at? Well, I think um, it's important to departmentalize your products. Um, putting those items together that really belong together instead of having kind of a, uh, too much of a mix of odds and ends. And because what you want to do is create a story, you want to create a purchase that has multiple items in it. You want to, you know, make it like, will all of that fit nicely together in a great gift basket? Does it all coordinate? You know, whether it's by the function of the product, whether it's by the color, um, the text, you know, the, the materials that, that it is. Be really conscientious when you're doing your product mixes and when you're doing your buying. Um, how is this object that I see here at the show that I think is really, really cool, but how is that going to relate to other things that I already have? Or what else do I need to purchase to coordinate with this item to make a great display? So just kind of collecting and putting the right products together is like a major hurdle because it visually those products look good to the eye, then you're going to make a good display out of them. Yeah, yeah a lot of, I think a lot of visual merchandising planning comes from the buying, mm -hmm. you know, what, what is your buying plan and don't overbuy. And, you know, sometimes you have minimums with new vendors, um, but be mindful of what are you going to do with all these products? And if you're in a very small store, you don't have a lot of space, you know, how do we really curate what's on the selling floor for people right. to, and as you said, kind of increase that basket sale, right? You know, it's not just the one thing, but they're going to do some add-ons. And, you know, we look at frequently bought items, um, destination type items and impulse items. And so identifying where we want to put those is also very important. Always keeping in mind, clean and simple and organized, right? Like when, mm -hmm. when Suzanne said in the very beginning, departmentalize, categorize, that's how people shop. Um, it's like reading a book. You know, they have to be able to see the chapter title and then get in and read the the lines once they get to the fixture. And they may not know that that's how they shop, but that's how we kind As of humans. put things together. We right. we connect things, and you know, if, if you have products that are um, very different in scope or purpose or color or shape or something and they are very disjointed, then it then I, I can't focus on something like that. I will probably walk right by it. I like to put put it all together for me. Mm -hmm. Let me see how that all works as a as a one. So you're talking kind of a uh, from like a category of different products, like having um, all soaps together or all kid products together, or right. is there any kind of um, you know, cross merchandising, or what would be some some kind of strategies or th our thoughts on bringing items that maybe aren't necessarily um, intuitively together, but bringing them to together as kind of to create that basket or to create kind of that larger that larger sale. Right. Well, so one of the ways you could do is maybe your front table display or your or one of your front displays is a color story. Maybe okay. you know it's you're coming into spring and you're like, I just want to do everything green. And even that alone can can um, create a display that is very cohesive. You know, you have different shades of green, but it, all the little products work together 
as long as you know they're in the proper positions and such like that. Yeah. So I think color is a is a great way to do it, or some sort of thematic. Um, maybe in your town that weekend you have a festival of um, cocktails. <laughs> no, Harley. <laughs> it's like Harley. I came to my head. Or, or yeah, maybe it's a Harley Davidson festival. Sure. So when I when Harley would have their anniversaries, and in my store, I would set up some sort of displays where I would have things that are kind of related to you know Harley Davidson. I'd have like real heavy iron metal kitchen gadgets, or I would have some cool framed prints that says "I like my hog," or 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 actually, you know, pig sculptures or something. Orange or, and black. Orange and black, or just something that kind of um, ties it ties everything together, together yeah. to celebrate an event or a weekend or a. Uh, a holiday or something like that yeah you're aiding the imagination mm -hmm. so it's and that really does help like the brain loves to be informed in an easy way or entertained in an easy right. way we talk about these emotional engaging retail experiences and emotion means your right brain it's connecting with something that makes us feel better makes us laugh um makes our day and that's what we try to do when we create display focal points. You know, merchandising is a little different than creating displays that have a theme and attract attention. You know, merchandising is what you do with all the products on a shelf or on a fixture. Um, and I do have some photos I can bring up later to identify those things if you want. But we'll, yeah. you can keep asking the questions. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. Having things, you know, uh, merchandised, displayed, kind of in a categorical or thematic, uh, having those kind of something to kind of tie that that whole display together and allow people to really know what they're shopping for, knowing kind of what that section is is all about. Um, but yeah, I love the the color idea, something to kind of bring everything together. I can see right now, especially as we're transitioning into fall, having your Halloween, having Thanksgiving, oh. all of these different oh. things going <laughs> to. Bring yes, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, we had mentioned even earlier of a, you know, focusing on the budget and having to maybe redesign your store uh, to completely do that for for stores. That is a financial investment and not every store can really go through that. So what would be some simple things that store owners could do to re-merchandise, re-display, kind of design their store differently that can make it look dramatically different? Mm -hmm. um, we always say that there are three things that a, a retailer can do that I think are two are fairly cost-effective and the third can be cost-effective, but that's um, adding an accent color to a wall, especially if you're trying to bring someone into the back of the store, mm -hmm. might be behind a checkout counter, it would be your brand color, but adding just a pop of color is fun, but even just a, a wall that you can change out seasonally, and it might be with some wall covering, and they have wall covering that's easy to pull up, to put up and pull off, um, and can be used again. So we like to have an accent wall that you can play with and it can change with the seasons or you can just keep it as your brand color. Second thing is signage. So we have a program we call Sign Design Guidelines and every sign that goes into your store should follow the guidelines of how it's designed. So what is a promotional sign, a sales sign, a product information sign, a department sign. You go to the little chart and it says, okay, all of our department signs have to be basically in this font, in three-dimensional letters, and this size, in this color. All of our promotional signs are going to be eight by 10, and they're going to be this font. And it's always with your brand guidelines. So if your brand has two or three fonts, you're using one of those. You might maybe have a stripe or a border around it. Um, so then you're training the customers to look for your repeat patrons to look for and read those signs quite easily. Like, oh, they have a promotion going on. Oh, they have a sale going on. Oh, they must have a new product. And I see a product information sign. They're not actually saying that, but subconsciously you've trained their brain to look for that. Yeah. So a sign program is, I think, fairly effective and easy to implement. And then the third thing is getting the right lighting. And this one where it can be tricky because if you're in an environment that you don't own the building or it's an old historic building and the electricity is bad or, you know, you, I mean, we're, we're literally helping a client right now. She has a 60 amp 
panel and really you need a minimum of 200 in a small store. So they're having to redo electrical completely, but that's another story. Um, most have 200 amp to pull from, but sometimes it's hard to get up above a, a tin ceiling to drop some power for track lighting. And, you know, it's really dim. I, I would say over 60% of the small retailers we visit, so it's inadequate lighting. lighting. Or mm -hmm. they go to Home Depot and they throw up some track heads with some screwing LED bulbs and they're just dull and they don't do anything. So we, I call myself like the lamp bulb, light bulb drug dealer because yeah. in my <laughs> trunk of my car, I have the right LED lamps that are screw in and you know, if we get on a ladder and we right. show them the difference and people are like, oh my gosh, you just made a huge difference in my store because now people see this highlighted right. display or focal point, or we washed a wall or we illuminated the logo behind the checkout counter. It is night and day. So lighting, signage, and color. Okay. And I have to say too, um, without spending a dime of money, um, uh, it's just a lot of muscle and uh, uh, some painkillers at night because you're <laughs> you're doing a lot. I would flip I would flip my floor all often, very often. Mm. You know, if you have the ability to move this table maybe over here and switch that rack with that rack, maybe raise the rack, lower the rack, put another table on top of a table, change the rack system on your wall by just making that all shells now and then doing that hanging rods. You, you know, you could have a merchandise in your store that maybe you've had for months and you do a floor flip like that and somebody comes in and they're like, oh, is this new? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> and they're not. Yeah. It's, it's... <laughs> and, and it makes your store look completely different and fresh and you haven't added a thing. Right. You haven't subtracted a thing. Oh you, God. you know, you haven't spent a dime. And honestly, just it's a refresh and it's and it's good for you too because yeah. sometimes you can get so bored with the way the floor is all laid out it's just like monotonous it's the same walk from the front door to your desk every day you want to change it up a little bit and you want to meet you need some new visual excitement as well right. how often are you talking so you, you know, said change frequently i assume that's not every week but how you well, know how often are you no, I mean, you know, sometimes it did depend upon like what sort of merchandise maybe I had coming in or, you know, there are months, uh, in January, February, March, I'm like, let's flip it. Like we were flipping it all the time and we had, um, you know, enough time to do it and we could do it easily. But, you know, it really depends on your store, but I'll bet I was doing major flips and I was moving furniture, um, you know, at least every six weeks or so, okay. at least. But I would say you but it did really, it quarterly. Right. It, it really help. depends upon your, your, uh, and you know, maybe your floor flip just entailed moving four fixtures, but that could be so impactful. Just keep moving it, you know? Yeah. Change it yeah. up. Make it interesting. Yeah, so in, in there, a balance of, you know, making things look different, but also you have customers that kind of maybe go to an area, kind right. of expect a product to be there. How right. did you balance that? Or were you just like, hey, it's in a different spot and you now get to explore more of my store that you might not Right. Have. And that, that I think is important too, because if you have something in that area all the time, that is that one customer's path and they don't go that way to see some of those other things. So as you're moving things around, um, my, my mother had a, a children's boutique store and we always kept the preteen in the back at this area. And we just started moving it, you know, ever so often. And it forced the customers to kind of go this way and go, oh, I didn't know you carried that. And I'm like, yeah, we've always had that, but it's been in this area. And they, you know, give them a different path too. It's just, it's a little bit and more I, exciting, especially for the regulars. Yeah, I think in, that works in a small retail environment. But when you get into grocery stores or some of the larger hardware stores, it is a little more difficult to move certain departments, not only just from a labor standpoint, but, it, you know, if you if you have really good traffic into certain aisles, sometimes you don't want to touch that because it, it's already very effective, but you might change something right in front of those aisles. Yeah. Um, so, hey, even our even my local Ace, they mm -hmm. changed the whole front area 
you know, where they used to have yeah, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. So the, all, yeah. it's all changed. And then they yeah. kind of switched. Some, they didn't remodel or anything. Right. They just moved fixtures. And now the front of the, sort of the store looks really good. And I'm like, oh, I can see more stuff over here. It's sometimes you just have to sit and stare at the things you have and then think, hmm, how could I shift that around yeah. and make it a little bit better? When you had brought up the, the topic of aisles, um, are there kind of some good best practices to do with aisles? Should they be, you know, directioned in different ways, parallel with the door, a perpendicular? How, kind of what are some thoughts about just, you know, designing aisles for your store? And the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> it, really, it depends on the type of store. I mean, there the boutiques, we like to have aisles that sort of meander and get people to meander around. But there are some environments where it's better to have a racetrack that gets people around and then you have the departments all on the outside. Uh, so it depends on size of the store departments, the number of SKUs, stop keeping units or products that you have on your selling floor, the types of fixtures, if they're movable or not. Um, I mean, that's the other thing. If you have one type of floor, you can move things around and make your own aisle wherever you want. But if you have your aisle is a different material, so let's say it's a vinyl plank floor, wood plank floor, that's different than carpeted departments, you know, you're kind of defined then to a more of that racetrack uh, layout. The other thing to always think about is people who bring strollers in, if this is your target market mm -hmm. or have briefcases or big bags, I always have a big over the shoulder bag um, and I don't want to have to feel like I'm going to hit and bump something. Right. So, you know, you definitely want your main aisle to be minimum of three feet wide. Uh, and, and that's the other thing where what, what we call product creep happens. And we might start out with something like that. And then all of a sudden someone starts putting baskets on the floor or a vendor brings in a fixture and all of a sudden your, your traffic aisles are getting narrower and narrower. And then pretty soon there aren't even any visible regular traffic aisles. And I'm telling you again, if people walk into stores like that, they go, Oh, I don't have time to shop this store. Sure. So they it's just stay crowded. up in the yeah. area and then they leave. And so can sometimes despite our best efforts, we're, uh, we'll do things, we'll um, set something up that actually might be a little bit counterproductive. What are, some visual, <laughs> what are some visual merchandising mistakes that you all have seen be made that we could avoid? I have a perfect example. I'm not going to name the chain. It's a franchise chain and everyone would know it. And they have really fabulous visual merchandising standards. So they have planograms, they have the fixtures that you can buy, they have the signage program. And a lot of the franchisees, you know, they start out following all of that. And then I was auditing some of them that have been around for a while. And oh my gosh, it they brought in products from all different types of vendors because they said, oh, we're gonna put in a gift department now. And oh my gosh, we're gonna add this and that. And I was like, what happened to the original franchise products? You know, where are they? And, you know, what happened to the signage? Or um, So again, I think retailers get swept away with falling in love with a lot of product lines, whether they fit in their genre mm -hmm. or not, right. um, or because they like it and they think other people will like it. And you really, it goes back to that really curating your inventory right to get to a point where you keep it clean and organized right. and not just, you know, and then bringing in baskets that don't even match your fixtures um, or, or dump bins or sale tables and right. putting tablecloths on them. And they think that that works as a fixture and you're diluting the whole brand and the whole retail environment itself. And sometimes they just can't see the forest for the trees. And right. it's, it's hard to do that subtraction method and just say, got to take that out, got to take that out. It doesn't belong. Right. Yeah. So it's Sometimes. decide on what, you know, your, your store is going to be. And then is that object going to fit within my store or do I need to open another store where that object can fit into? <laughs> right. So, yeah, because I do see that product chaos is, yeah. is hard. Um, one thing about visual merchandising that really bugs me, and I guess maybe it's just my brain, but a lot of times there might be a fixture, maybe sometimes it's the vendor provide, provided fixture and you've done really well and you're selling it. And now like this big fixture you have on your floor and there's like, um, you know, 
25% of it is filled with merchandise. And I, I hate all that empty space. It's right, taking right. up too much real estate. And I love, you know, let's condense. Let's Can we move that off the floor for a while so you get more? How can we work with um, fixtures that are not, you know, they. Sh I like the terms full and fluffy. I'm like, I always make it look full and fluffy like you have inventory. When I go in shops and I see fixtures that are, you know, one third full or 25% full or or like two things hanging on it, yeah. it drives me nuts because I'm thinking, are you going out of business? That's right. Are you not going to carry this are line anymore? Or or you just don't, you know, you got to wait until the last one sells before you refill. Right. <laughs> that kind of thing drives me crazy because there's got to be something fresh and new and it's taking way too much real estate, that's just precious. Yeah. Especially yep. for a small floor, um, away from what you can, you know, making more sales. And I love that example, Suzanne, because it's the opposite of the overstuffing yeah. the store. It's the under, under inventory, not having enough. Not having and enough. I, yeah, we've seen that too, where, oh my gosh, you're in way too much square footage. If nothing else, you know, put a false wall up and right. make your space smaller. So it looks full. So and we call that critical mass. It's mm -hmm. like the critical amount, the sweet spot of how many products you should really have on your selling floor. How do you determine that? What is kind of the, I mean, is that? It's, it's having, as you said, full and fluffy fixtures, but having available traffic aisles, also having those focal points that are separate from all of the fixtures so the eye can rest and absorb the theme of that display. And it leads the customer, you know, you have them strategically located so the customer right. can walk the entire store. And you, you know, you can look at um, your sales figures too and figure that out as well. Mm -hmm. If you're like this brand, um, you know, is in the, this department has its own brand or, or this, this vendor has its own department and, you know, my sales are really, really good. And then it's just, it's, it's, it's going down and down and down and down. Is this something that still needs to be around? Do I still need to be working on bringing this item here or even having this item here? If you're not making money off of it, that's a right. good key to think, do I need this on my floor or can I bid and let's try something different? Yeah, that real right. estate, you could be doing something else with that real estate right. that can right. bring you that's that. That's the whole point. You got to see, yeah. you know, you're there to sell stuff. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we all love our stores. We all have, you know, it's, it's our babies, but, yeah. but you know, you gotta, you, you gotta be able to, you know, be make smart. some cash on it. Be conscious of how much is, you know, that real estate is, is it making in right. your store is how right. many turns, how much, you know, money yes. is that section bringing in exactly. for you? And if it's yeah. not cut and muster, then yeah, you need to you need to do something else there. Yeah. And I find too, it's a lot in a lot of the small stores too. They're like, oh, you know, he, they're like, uh, you know, work friend of my sister in law. So I decided to bring their line in. But I have how many of you sold? Oh, I haven't really sold any, <laughs> but we've had them for now a couple years. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like. You don't have to be that nice. Right. <laughs> How is that affecting your bottom line? Yeah. Right. What yeah, can like, we put here that's going to sell? Right. That that real estate is precious. And right. Right, maybe you put it somewhere else where you get some better, but yeah, having that, you know, in that spot or, you know, in, in taking up space. Um, yeah, that, that can be dangerous. So. Yeah. Oftentimes, you know, we maybe don't like to admit to ourselves that uh, we need help. Uh, that mm -hmm. we need to re-merchandise. What are some questions that retailers should be asking themselves when they look at their store and assess their layout to see if they need to make some changes to things? I I honestly like to hear what my employees have to say. Um, I always took their feedback and um, that helps guide me in a lot of ways as to what changes I need to be or what suggestions they have to offer because they're you know, usually in the thick of it just like you are. And um, they hear customers' reactions. You have to listen to your customers. You have to you know, hear what you know, those people who are intimate with you in that store are saying and um you know take what they take with what they're saying and i would also say if there was a a very successful retailer in town that that person can go over and ask and say what's your formula you know what what is and hopefully it's not they're not selling similar product lines right. but um they could just say is it you know did you do something 
um, when you first laid this store out, what was your thought process or how do you do your buying or how do you create displays that coordinate with your marketing messages that go out? I think you can learn a lot from really successful retailers. They've already made mistakes, I'm sure. And so if they could be a mentor, yeah, uh, I guess the retailer needs to get to that point though. And that's the other thing. I think a lot of retailers for good reason are, are proud and they're they're entrepreneurs. I mean, they right. didn't want to work for anyone else. They want to work for themselves. They feel they've got good ideas and many do, but it is hard sometimes to say jeepers, I, you know, one more quarter I'm gonna, or one more year I'm going to see. And meanwhile, their bank account and their spouse often is like, yeah, you're out at the end of this year if you don't make any more money. Um, so sometimes it is hard to ask for help. But I think that's where main street managers and bid directors and um, can sometimes be helpful or just neighboring retailers that are successful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I always it was very I was always very involved with like our local chamber of commerce um, or our neighborhood organizations, because even going to like a breakfast meeting and you're talking to, you know, the folks that have the jewelry store over there or maybe they have the sandwich shop or just being involved in the neighborhood and hearing what's going on and, and getting feedback from your neighbors who um, are in that same area as you, I think that's really important as well. Yeah. And I think that also helps kind of take out some of the emotional investment in it. If you're asking them, right. they're and always. Right. Yeah, always know you're not in that boat alone. <laughs> right. Trust me, you are not in that boat alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, allow them to uh, give, hear, what are your thoughts on this? Is you might be too close to it sometimes right. and right. Uh, to really understand what changes changes you need to make. So, right. yeah. Are there any emerging trends in merchandising or store design that retailers can incorporate into their business? Well, a big one right now is biophilia. So it's it's basically bringing nature in and creating healthy environments. So whether it's bringing plants, but if you bring plants, then you have to make sure that you keep them alive and looking good. Yeah. Um, it's it's actually bringing in, elevating the light source. So uh, not having these darker environments. I just can't tell you how many retailers are and small businesses are they don't they don't understand how dark the environment is right. that they're working in and right. what it could be but then also bringing in the right type of light um just not going and getting light bulbs and not understanding the color rendering index or the kelvin temp or the lumen output so you know there's some education behind that piece um they even say artwork that ha ha brings in nature or is related to nature can be helpful um, it's materials that are natural, sustainable, um, a lot of eco-friendly things. And then the other thing is authenticity and a story, telling a story like the history of the building or the history of the business or the history of the owner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people love to learn those things. And so I would say, you know, biophilic authenticity, sustainability, and telling a story. Those would be my trends. Yeah. And and I also think, and people have done this too in the past. It's not really that trendy, but I see more and more um, small businesses where they're offering how-tos or classes or um, where were we? We were in this, well, I love plants. So we were in this great um, uh, plant store, but it was a little bit more than a plant store. They had a great variety of live plants to purchase, the pots, the soil, all that sort of, um, uh, all the other accessories and things. But then they had a little corner and it was a build your own terrarium. So you could, you know, you had everything there, the glass, the terrarium, and it was not, it didn't take up a lot of space on this, in the store. It was like a nice little counter, but, you know, doing something with the things that you're purchasing um, sure. is really cool. Or, or you know, still bringing somebody in that is, you know, uh, making what the objects are that you're selling. Or just, there's something about, like you said, education. And actually, physically, everybody wants experiences now more so than ever. So as long as you're in here shopping, why don't you make this terrarium? Because I'm going to charge you for all of these bits and bobs that go in the terrarium. And then and then we'll make it. And then you can walk away with something really special that you just made. So if there's anything that you could do to like 
and mm -hmm. that experience an experience as well as shopping in the right. store. Um, and that goes kind of to flexible fixtures that might be on casters that so you right. could roll them off to the side to bring in someone who's going to give a presentation. I, I think retailers have to stand on their heads these days to really think out of the box. It's not about putting products on shelves anymore and then standing at the counter and hoping Maybe. people buy. Right. It is like have a fashion show, you know, build a little okay. um, runway for and bring or bring in the local TV anchor person or the weather person and have them announce something. I, I mean, it is amazing. Have a square dance. I yeah. mean, if you're in a boot so store, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are just think out of the box as much right. as possible to create those experiences. Right. And that's one thing I'm wonderful about an independent retail store is that you can do those things that, you know, a, a bigger box, a larger chain either can't or wouldn't do, but you can be inventive and creative like that and have a fashion show, have a runway, have a build your own, you know, something to really bring that experience that makes you stand out. That makes it so much of a better experience than going into you know, a big box store where everything it's, it's the exact same, no matter if you're in one in Chicago or San Diego, they're, they're all, they all look the same. You get to have your own, own experience with that. Right. Um, exactly. We or couple, you know, even yeah. things like, even things like hosting, maybe it's not part of you, you know, what you do for a business, but you host a, like a little charity thing. Like, like we used to pause in Chicago. We, they used to have like a, you know, they bring some animal, rescue animal dogs paws. or something, yeah. animal paws. It was an organization for, you know, dog adoption. And, you know, you could host a little thing like that where they would be there for two hours on a Saturday. And, and it just, you know, you get there in that you get um, their promotions because they're going to put that out on social media, come down to this really great shop and come meet our dogs. And then you bring people in from your own customers. And it's just, it's a good thing that you're doing for the community. And it's, and it still brings people in. Or taking Put your, your stuff on there. the road to do a pop-up somewhere. Yeah. Pop -up. So, or a farmer's market, um, you know, take the store on the road or part of it. Yeah. See, we could go on and on, Patrick. I think we have to have a part two. Okay. Hey, that's all right. We can. We can schedule part two for sure. Um, we did have some questions, but I know you had some some pictures. Do you want to so, share? Why don't we do the, the questions first? I sure. think we, yeah. we hold the pictures for part two. All right. We're going to hold them, hold them hostage. How's there we that? go. All right, everyone, you all hear it. There will be a part two. We'll be talking more about visual merchandising. <laughs> we'll get that scheduled. But um, so we have a question from Jennifer who asked, and I think this was uh, in reference to Lynn, you had talked before about whether you're owning your space, but uh, opinion on a standalone store versus having a store in a mall. Example, a small town with uh, 10,000 people, not a strip mall, but an actual mall. It depends on the how successful that mall is doing. Um, right. You know, I always look at the the amount of traffic and the other successful retailers, particularly asking other retailers either in the mall or in a standalone area. Um, I, I I just finding that space is so critical. It's still location, location, location. Unless you are you have such an amazing destination product or service mm -hmm. that people will drive anywhere to find you, but as, as soon as right. you're going into a mall, you know it's, it's a different flavor. Um, so there, I mean, we'd be happy to talk to you about that offline because that is, a, I think, a longer conversation. But just quickly too, we've worked with a lot of pop-up retailers that went into uh, as a temporary leasee at a at a large mall here in Milwaukee. And um, we've worked with them to get their stores set up and some signage and things like that. And um, some of them made it and some of them didn't. Um, and it really depends upon what your product mix is because if you're going into a mall and you're a boutique, you're competing with a lot of other boutiques in there. And, um, but there were some people that were like, you know, I can take this lease for a year or they can take it for 10 months or whatever it was. And they just went in, put their heart and soul, and they needed a bigger space at the end of that term. Right. So, um, you know, it, variables. It, it's, really. There's so many variables, and well, malls are so up, up and, and down. down. It depends and on your area, absolutely. Yeah. And um, who are your neighbors, and are there vacant storefronts near you? Because um, it's hard if you've got three vacant storefronts near you. It's 
it's a it's a believe it or not it just pulls the energy down people tend not to go to those stores that have vacant storefronts around them sure. you have yeah. to be really the the if you're going in yeah. a location where you are surrounded by some vacant places you've got to be the shining star and you've got to like blow your horn and and you know scream look at me look at me look at me just to you know get and those people if the landlord will even let you do and, that yeah. that's the other thing you know talk to the landlord of the mall versus uh, you know if whoever owns the other spot that you're looking at going into and what are they going to allow right. you to do or not do right you know looking at leases is important right. um, and with malls sometimes you have to abide by all the mall hours which is a lot of payroll it really, it really, there's, there's a pros and cons list for both of them and just writing it all down and yeah. seeing which one. That's a hard better question. Fit. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Jennifer throw us did, easier one. <laughs> she did follow up with the downtown has been quiet and that's her other choice. I'll, I'll make sure you all get her, your contact information. Uh, you all can, can talk and kind of, we're going to work through that. I imagine. Um, <laughs> Another question, if, if you all have other questions, you know, please put them in the comments or the Q&A. But um, another question came from Carol. Our store is in a small town with little other shopping available within 30 minute drive. So how do we accommodate all the town's needs without carrying too much? So you all had talked about overstuffing. Um, we are a pharmacy with a gift shop, a hearing aid center, a gun shop, a sporting goods a store, housewares, toys, and baby and everything else under the sun. How do we accommodate that? Well, then you're just, you're the general store right. in town. Right. You're like the classic. I mean, I would go with that as long as you, as long as you're careful with how much square footage you have and how many product lines you have in there. I mean, we do love that general store. Know, yeah. And you know what we see when we go to a lot of the main street, small communities is we'll go um, visit a store and they own, let's say a hat shop. Um, but they also own the ice cream store across the street and they also own <laughs> a restaurant. Uh, yeah, yeah. A burger place. And it's, it's like they, they, what they're doing is not only investing in their own one business, they're investing in the community. And I think sometimes a lot of those small communities is it's like, go big or go home. You, you know, maybe, and I know that's, that's a, a dollar sign there, but having more facilities to bring more yeah, people down into the downtown area. If you have a little shop and you're like, gosh, this, this, um, you know, this community, we could really use a, you know, a, a, a shoot, shoe store, you know, consider if you can. Yeah, I guess I think of wall drug. Yeah, you know, they yeah. started so, out, yeah. you know, just one thing, and then they added more and they added more. And then that the key is to make sure that you're good in all the departments. So I mean, the fact that you sell guns, I mean, it has to be a really interesting gun department, well signed, well, good showcases, someone who knows how to sell the right. guns. And then, you know, you've got a gift store, which is completely different. But then I want to feel like I'm walking into a gift department. Right. So I don't want to feel like the guns have leached into the gift department and vice versa. And the same thing with all of your other categories. You know, right. if you have a little, like, um, almost like a convenience store of aspirin and um, snacks and things. Yeah. That's its own department. So I think it's look at the space you have, departmentalize it big time. And if you have to add more space, I don't know if there are other buildings available or you right. put a, you add something on. If you can get the space next door and then make that your sundry store, you know, right. your aspirins and your, and your drugstore type things. And maybe you're going to be, you know, you're going to become the be wall drug. That, you know, influences what the development of that downtown area right is. if you if you're like the only one and you're drawing from a big area you have a lot of opportunity but you just don't want to take on too much that you can't handle it so i would take baby steps in that regard but the ones that we went to some of them were like wow you know yeah, oh, yeah. really nobody, done a great job nobody had a coffee shop so we decided right. to also open the coffee shop and so, right. so we run that and then we've got this and we got that and, and you start it, and pulling in like, and the employees and, just started coming it's coming yeah you know you sometimes it's a very big step to take but you, you know, might change you, the name if, of the town if you're sure. if your customers are saying we need this we need this that's a buzz that's a business plan too. yeah that's a big business plan. yeah Oh, um, tough questions. 
you started out with a, a big question and now we're even getting these. Hey, I, there are a lot of people wanting to know, wanting to pick your brains, wanting to wanting yeah. to get in there and, and find out more. Uh, Mallory has a question. Uh, do you find that volume can increase of a certain product, such as buying a lot of candles to make a large statement display versus a select few candles? Mm -hmm. Yes, that goes a bit back to the kind of that critical mass. Now you don't, if you're a home decor store, you don't want half of the store to be candles, but you also don't want four candles. You want to fill a fixture full of candles. So it has to be in the right proportion to the rest of the merchandise in the store. If you are a candle store, obviously that's a whole different conversation, but I would say, yeah, it's that critical mass. It's kind of understanding the right. por proportion of, space you want to devote to it and what's the markup on them right because you, yes because mark, i was going to say you don't want markup if you're getting a better price if you can if you have to buy it you know 12 dozen of them versus one dozen and it is a product that you have a history of selling that and you that make you a good profit it's, on it it's a good and you can get a better margin on by buying more and it's also not perishable Right. Um, or, you know, affected by environmental changes. But don't put and, them all out either so that it's like, oh my God, I don't have any room in my back room. I put all the candles out because that doesn't look right either. It's because then you have way too right. many of each style and each color and each aroma. You have to have some in back stock and have just, it's it's a right. visual. That's where photos are really helpful because you can kind of say, this is exactly the amount that you should have on this fixture, in this product category, in this department, relative to your other, the rest of the right. store. And it's true relative to the others, because if the rest of your store is very clean and simple, and you've got one table that's just masked out, that doesn't yeah. work either. But I don't think there's anything wrong with massing out. There's a store, Fish's Eddie in New York, which is one of my favorites, and it's all glassware and then platters and things. And they just like blow up baskets full of stuff. And it's so enticing. It's just like, ooh, I need. But they do that well throughout the whole really store. Well and that's the their store. thing. Right. So it just depends upon how your other things are. But I'm not opposed to um, mass displays. Yeah, agreed. Of the, but of the you don't want too. the tail wagging the dog. Where it's like, oh, they overbought in candles. And it's like the right. whole store is candle heavy. <laughs> you know, nothing else is. So that's what I meant. It has to blend right. with how you merchandise. A good display thing. worth and being able to kind of build from there. And you're probably also going back to, you know, is it working for you? Are people coming in for this? Maybe we can expand there um, and, and bring in more. So Right. Exactly. We just should do one of these on site on someone, someone who was willing to do it where we actually are on site uh -huh. pointing things out. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I don't have any other questions that have come in, but uh, we've covered a lot. What would be just kind of a couple, you know, takeaways if, you know, you know bite size, you know, some takeaways that people should should walk away with from today? Well, I feel that it's important for all store owners to find the joy in your business mm -hmm. okay. um, because we have been in some spaces where it's like, it's too much, they're tired and you don't, there's not that little twinkle in their eye anymore. And you, it's so important to have that little bit, that, that joy. Sometimes, some days it's not going to be that great, yeah. but on the whole you still have to really love what you do and love coming into work and love meeting your customers. And there has to be some, you know, that, that retail is retail is entertainment these mm -hmm. days. It's, it's not what it used to be. And that's where I think some of the younger retailers that are coming in, they do see it completely different. We didn't even talk about digital and right. omni-channel retailing and how we want to make sure the website and social media platforms are, placed, you know, throughout the store because customers these days want to be able to access you 24 yeah. seven, just because you're closed at five or six or whatever at night, they still want to be able to see on the door that, oh, they have a website or they have a social media, they have a Facebook page. I'm going to get on there and get more information. So it is, it is all about entertaining, communicating, engaging people. And if you're not like that, it can be a struggle. And so, yeah, if you're, you don't have the twinkle and might, you know, time to make a change, time to do something yeah. else, time to, right. you know, really um, look at, look at your store different. Right. Yeah. 
And maybe it's just the product that you're offering. Maybe you still love being in retail, but maybe it's the product and you're just, but if, you know, make sure you still have that, that, that bit of joy and playing um, because, yeah. It should be fun. Otherwise, no one should be not happy in their job. It doesn't even matter what you're doing. Exactly. Well, we don't have any more questions. So Lynn, Suzanne, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. Absolutely. This has been fantastic. I hope everyone out there has learned a whole lot. Um, real quickly, where can they find you? How can they get in contact with you all? So retailworksinc.com is our website. Um, and it would be lfalk at retailworksinc.com or s Raffenstein. Yeah, that's a long that's one. one. Just go to the website <laughs> and you'll get, there's a contact page and there's a newsletter they can sign up for. And I just want to say, Patrick, you are really good at what yeah. you're doing. You're a great moderator. I'm so happy that you're at the head of Heart on Main Street. Well, thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's uh, very kind of you. And yeah, I'm really enjoying doing this and I've had really enjoyed our conversation. We can tell. Yeah, See? good, good. <laughs> uh, before we jump off, I do want to uh, put out there, Heart on Main Street, if you've been following us, uh, we have done a lot with retailers that have been impacted by natural disasters. And mm -hmm. right now there are a couple going on, but especially one uh, with the fires in Hawaii. And if you have the means, if you are able to, we are raising money to help out retailers in Hawaii that have been impacted, help them get back on their feet, help them them open up their stores again and continue to serve right. their community. So um, you can either donate to Heart on Main Street through our website, heartonmainstreet.org, or through a, a Facebook fundraiser that we have going on. All proceeds of that do go to independent retailers. Um, everything that we are uh, generating, we give back to the independent retail community. So I would love it if you were able to, to donate to, to, to that cause. Uh, next, actually in two weeks, we are having another webinar. Uh, generally, we've been doing monthly, but we kind of have some back-to-back -back here. Uh, and this one is about an ERC, or the Employee Retention Credit Refund, that um, is out there through the federal government. They are giving out money for businesses that experienced a decrease in 2020 and 2021. Um, so if you would like to learn about how to get your employee tax, employee refund credit, which can be up to $26,000 per employee, um, definitely sign up to learn about that. Our, that webinar is September 6th. So again, Lynn, Suzanne, thank you so, so much for being on today. Um, and I look forward to part two of our webinar. Yeah, great. Thank you, Patrick. Right. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.